We are deeply honoured to have you speak here this evening uh, and uh, Alvi's lecture will be on the subject of offenders and victims, truth, punishment and reconciliation. Uh, meeting truly good uh, and indeed uh, people who have sacrificed their lives uh, in the cause of democracy uh, and justice has been one of the great privileges of my time in office as Lord Advocate and subsequently in, in Oxford. And during that time, I have met so many good people, and I say ordinary, not in a pejorative sense, but ordinary people, witnesses, uh, and those who, whose courage has been immense in the face of great adversity. Uh, but uh, in the last few years, uh, I had the great privilege of sitting beside uh, Alby at lunch at Edinburgh University, where you received a, one of your many doctorates, I should say, along with Mary Robinson, uh, the former president of Ireland. And it, it was one of these lunches where you just pinch yourself because of the, the, the conversation, the humour, the wonderful uh, company of these two great people. Since then, I have also uh, met Aung San Suu Kyi, who is an alumna uh, of my college at Oxford. Uh, and the, the one abiding feature of all these great people uh, is their humility and their stillness, uh, the tranquility in the sense of, of, of their knowledge that what they must do uh, is continue uh, in their mission to try and secure a better planet. Uh, and uh, that certainly is something which um, I have, uh, along with everyone else here, observed in terms of your own life story. Uh, this is a very, very special person. Uh, he uh, was appointed uh, in 1994 by President Mandela. And again, on that note, again, I, we appreciate greatly that you're here tonight where there are very, very sad and poignant circumstances in South Africa. And we're just so glad that you are here tonight um, in those circumstances. But President Mandela appointed uh, Albi to the, uh, as a justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa in 1994, where he sat until 2009, retired, having issued a number of very significant judgments and opinions which are admired across the world. Uh, and one of particular significance in Scotland at this time is the Minister of Home Affairs against Fleury in 2005, in which you sent back to the Parliament a statute which uh, d defined marriage as only between those of opposite genders. And of course, it's an issue which is very much uh, current in Scotland now, where that matter is before our Scottish Parliament. And again, I hope they will all read closely uh, your wonderful opinion in that particular case, one of many great opinions. The career in human rights activism for Albie Sachs started at the age of 17 in 1952 uh, when he uh, was at university in his defiance against unjust laws and that campaign against the vile regime of apartheid in South Africa. At the age of 21, Abi was already practicing at the bar, defending people who were charged under that regime uh, and under the, the, the racist laws which existed at that time. He was subsequently arrested, uh, having been a restricted person, and placed uh, in solitary confinement where he stayed for over five months and was subjected to torture uh, by way of sleep deprivation uh, and other uh, matters at that stage. Following that period of imprisonment, he, he moved into exile uh, in England and thereafter in Mozambique. Uh, and he was professor of law and director of research uh, in Mozambique at that stage. In 19 in 1988, uh, Albi was blown up by the uh, secret police, uh, South African secret police, his, uh, a bomb having been placed in your vehicle, I think at that stage, Albi, uh, where he lost his arm and uh, the sight in one eye and a bystander and, uh, was, uh, was killed. Despite that horrendous attack on his life, his courage was consolidated and he knew at that point uh, that in order to achieve uh, vengeance for his attack, the way to achieve that was by the rule of law and through democracy. Uh, and again, he has very much achieved that through his writings and through his opinions and the work which he continued to carry out. He returned to South Africa where he participated in the preparations for the new constitution, uh, preparing the constitution and working uh, again as a member of the uh, national executive of the ANC. Uh, and his influence in the new democracy of South Africa has been immense. Thereafter, as I mentioned in the court, he has uh, also been a very, very powerful figure in influencing the future of South Africa. He has written prolifically uh, through his periods. There is the 
the books which refer to his jail diary of Albie Sachs, then his free diary of Albie Sachs, Sexism and the Law, and thereafter uh, he has written about the soft vengeance of the freedom fighter. Uh, his recent book uh, in 2011, uh, The Strange Alchemy of Life and Law, is one which was published in 2011 and which Lord Justice Wolfe uh, indicated every judge in the country should read. And it's a wonderful illustration of the great compassion, the great humanity and wisdom of the man who you're now about to hear, Albie Sachs. Imagining I'm back up on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first memorial lecture. I'm looking at the family. I think it's a very wonderful moment, and in some ways a very poignant moment. It's, it's memorializing your brother, your father, uh, in a special way, but lodging him in the past as well. Um, and I should imagine it's a kind of painful joy and perhaps a joyous pain uh, that I feel to some extent at this moment. I didn't know him. Uh, we hadn't corresponded. He wasn't, as far as I know, part of the anti-apartheid movement, which would have made it an easy <laughs> form of contact. But the affinity is very real. And perhaps even stronger because I didn't know him, because we were bound not by obvious ties of family, of common activities in any particular way, but by what I'm hearing is trying to achieve similar things. We were very different in many other ways. He was obviously very good with his hands, even when I had two hands. <laughs> now I have an excuse. <laughs> Uh, and people ask, were you right-handed before the bomb? And I say, no, I was ambidextrous, equally useless with both hands. <laughs> uh, I started very young at law. 21, I was already practicing an advocate. He started late. Uh, the only book I believe that he wrote was on traffic law. It's almost the only topic I haven't written on. <laughs> uh, but the, the bonds, I think, are very real. Uh, and certainly the things that I would like to be described as or to achieve, uh, when I hear the word greed, the Scottish Glaswegian pronunciation, I'm not going to try and get it, <laughs> but greed sounds so much better than good. <laughs> greed is really, 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 really good. <laughs> and when... He's described as a good man and a good judge. It's not just saying he was clever and he was smart. It's saying something about his heart, uh, his spirit, his values, uh, the qualities that he invested into everything that he did, the decisions that he took, and the way he interacted with people. And clearly amongst his great qualities was he was a good teacher because people speak about the impact that he had on them through his teaching. And the sense that I get is it's precisely because he came to law late that he was such a good teacher. Partly for unfortunate reasons. Most of us get socialized so early on when we study law that we get so wrapped up in the formulas and the style and the voice and the body language of the law that we lose that intimate, ordinary contact. He was too established as a person, as a human being in life already to now pretend that he was anything other than he was. And that meant he became a good communicator, somebody who could 
connect up and get through and relate to people in a very special way. And the attendance here, uh, I'd like to flatter myself, the attendance here is a little bit, teeny bit, because of L.B. Sachs. But overwhelmingly, it's because of John Fitzsimons. Uh, and everybody who mentions his name does so with, with a kind of pleasure uh, and acknowledgement and recognition uh, that that is, is, is very warm and very special. And I would like to feel that the fund for which you uh, spoke uh, will get support not simply, and if I can add my little pitch now, not simply to do justice to people in John's position who had to battle so hard late in life and in a way put so much strain on their families, not only to do justice to them, but to justice to justice. Because it means mature people are coming into the law with rich life experience and they're contributing something extra. They're not just lawyers' lawyers. They're bringing something extra and that's something extra that he gave. And so if the people now who are coming fairly late into legal practice and they can only manage it because of the support they're getting from this fund. It's, as I mentioned, it's not simply a question of equity and fairness and finding talent that you wouldn't find otherwise, but bringing that extra layer, that extra quality, that extra texture and richness to the practice of law. The Scottish connection is, is strong. I can say this, I speak in many countries in many places, uh, and the connection with South Africa and with the struggle for liberation, for freedom in our country, uh, because people all over the world connected up with us. And although uh, John himself didn't have a special interest, and if he'd come to Cape Town on the cruise liner and tried to see me in court, he would have had to fly up to Johannesburg <laughs> and he might have missed the boat on the way out to <laughs> New Zealand or wherever it was going. Uh, but the Scottish connection was a very real one and a very special one. And Cyrus, I don't know if it was accident or design. If it was accident, it was a lucky accident. If it was design, it was intelligent design. But on the way to the hotel, I don't think you took the shortest route. And we passed a little place and I saw the sign and it said Mandela, Mandela Place. Accident or design, each equally uh, fortuitous and, and, and uh, felicitous. And of course it meant a lot to me. Uh, this is a kind of strange and, and grave time for us. We love Mandela. Tata, Madiba. We, we don't want him to die. It's just good to know that he's still surviving and the longer he survives, just so the more comfortable we feel. It's inevitable that he will die. He, he used to love telling the story 20 years ago, he had gray hair and meeting some young boy and the boy looks up at him and says, uh, are you a hundred? <laughs> and we all burst out laughing. Well, he made 94. He might even make 95. He's getting pretty close. And he just represents a quality that, that is so good. And the things that he did were done in a way that was so admirable and, and memorable, can I say, that's so geed, that's so geed, uh, that we want to cling to the knowledge that he hasn't passed away. In political terms, he's left us a long time ago. Even at the World Cup in 2010, he, he came out in a wheelchair, he waved to everybody, he didn't really speak. Uh, and we recognize that, that he's lived this very full life and the two points that are emerging from the commentaries that are being made in South Africa, the one is from his family, that he is at peace. They feel that, he's at peace. <coughs> uh, he opens his eyes occasionally, he can smile occasionally, but they sense that he is at peace. And the other is the comment that he 
made his contribution an enormous contribution, which means that his passing is less drastic than it might be otherwise. He was there at the time when new institutions were being put in place. And of course, the legal institutions played a very, very special role in that regard. And so in that sense, the very extent of his contribution makes it easier to say goodbye to him because it's not as though there's an absence of the things that he established and created. The Scottish connection then that just came as a flash to my mind. Uh, it's more Edinburgh than, than Glasgow in the sense that people went to study at the University of Edinburgh and Tia Sorga, one of the great African leaders of the 19th century, was received there, treated as a human being, and fell in love with and married a Scottish woman. She came back as his wife, became integrated into African family and culture, and that's one of the great South African families. And one of the reasons also for the special contact was the Scottish Enlightenment, something which I only discovered when I came to Scotland, a kind of at a time when the other part of the British Isles was subject to so much irrationality and suppression of ideas. People were debating and talking and discussing, contacting, linking up with Europe and the most advanced ideas of the age were being debated in the different parts of Scotland. And one of the persons, the product of that enlightenment, was Thomas Pringle, who went out to the Eastern Cape uh, in the early 19th century, very early on got into conflict with Lord Somerset, the governor. I think it's not unknown that Scottish people have got into conflict with certain <laughs> oppressive, imperious, uh, authoritarian rulers and governors. He wrote beautiful poetry, and poetry about the Amakosa, the African people, respecting their dignity, their culture, their ways of doing things, uh, and the, the, the humanity that they exerted. It wasn't these savages out there whose only destiny was to be conquered and to be converted from being heathens into good Christians. Their destiny was to live as free human beings. And it came through in this very beautiful poetry. And some of the links with Scotland were to get education, which they could then bring back to South Africa in different ways, infuse, and also tell people in Scotland about their continent. Um, so that it wasn't the dark continent, it was the light continent, the continent of humanity, of spirit, of feeling, and of intense human association. Dr. Ab Abdurrahman descended from slave family through education, trying to advance, beginning of the 20th century, studies medicine, qualifies at the University of Edinburgh. I don't know if there's something special about women in Scotland, but he fell in love. <laughs> and she fell in love with, with him and went back to South Africa. And that also became a great South African family. He, he became one of the principal leaders of the freedom struggle, trying to unite all the different sections of the press community, the beginning of the 20th century. And one of his daughters, Sissy Gould, was somebody now enters into my life. She claims that I used to sit on her lap when I was a child. Uh, and she was the one who persuaded my mother when my mother sadly had separated from my dad, came to Cape Town. She said, come and stay with me. That's with her sissy, who was then living with a great lawyer called Sam Khan, right next to the beach. And it meant I grew up right next to the beach. And our home now is right next to the beach. So there's an indirect Scottish connection, even even in, in, in that sense. She was a brilliant orator and, and a great personality and the first person of color to be on the city council in, in Cape Town. And one of those little influences in my life that you grow up with strong, brilliant, 
orators, uh, full-hearted people, happen to be women, you end up a feminist, you don't stand a chance. <laughs> uh, and so in a, in, a, in a way, it's also thank you to Scotland. The last Scottish connection is more Glaswegian. I don't know if there's anybody in this room who knew Cecil Williams. Uh, Cecil was a theatre director. He was the driver for Nelson Mandela when Mandela was captured. He went on many dangerous missions working for the underground. People really loved Cecil. He was funny, he was eloquent, he was brave. And eventually he had to escape after Mandela and all the others were arrested, put on trial for their lives. And he fled to Glasgow with his young Glaswegian partner. Uh, I think he would have been very interested in the legislation you were speaking about. He would have been very proud of South Africa, that he could have married his partner, John, in South Africa. And he came here, I'm not sure if he even lectured at the University of Strathclyde. In those days, it's a little bit of a blur, Scotland, you know, the different places, universities. But he was given a home here, and he worked here. And we all felt a special connection, uh, a special sense of, you received him. Glasgow received him with open arms. He could do his work, he could lead his life, he could speak about South Africa, and he died here in, in Glasgow. So again, this is a thank you, Glasgow, uh, and the people in Glasgow. The title has, of my lecture is, is very long, and I'm going to reduce it to a presentation on one three-syllabled word, Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U. And I'll tell you how the term Ubuntu and what the term means entered into our law in South Africa in the most dramatic way. It couldn't have been a more dramatic case. It dealt with the constitutionality of capital punishment. On February the 14th, 1994, 1995, 11 of us were sworn in as judges of the Constitutional Court, and we were sworn in front of Nelson Mandela, who stood up to a frame and said, the last time I stood up in court was to find out if I was going to be hanged. Today I rise to inaugurate South Africa's first Constitutional Court. And the next day we're considering the constitutionality of capital punishment. 400 people on death row. South Africa with the very dubious distinction of having the highest rate of judicial execution in the world, even higher than Texas today. 100 every year, multiple gallows to make the execution more uh, cost efficient. And we have to decide, is capital punishment compatible with our new constitutional order? It's a hard case. It's a deep case. It's one of those issues people feel very, very profoundly about. You can't decide it just on a show of hands. You can't decide it just on a few words. It touches on philosophy, your view of the world, your view of the nature of punishment, the view of human relationships. And we didn't discuss any of our cases before a hearing. It was one of the rules of our court. It's a new court with a new constitution. We want to come fresh to argument, open-minded to any persuasion that we might get from counsel appearing before us. And then we discuss it afterwards, three days of hearing. And we decide unanimously, capital punishment is at complete variance with the kind of society envisaged by those of us who drafted the new constitution and parliament that adopted the new constitution with over 80% majority representing the whole nation. It just didn't belong. And Arthur Chaskelson, 
who went straight from being at the bar to become Chief Justice of South Africa, the first judgment he wrote was on capital punishment. And it's one of the great judgments of all times. Maybe because it was so pristine and new, maybe because the issue was so grand and so powerful. And basically his position was that our law prevents with our Bill of Rights any cruel, inhuman, degrading punishment or treatment. And also our law explicitly re recognizes human dignity as foundational. Our law also allows for limitations on rights if the limitations are reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society. So the issue then was, can you justify capital punishment on the basis, this was the argument of the state, that it deters future killings, it's protecting life through having capital punishment. Nelson Mandela sent counsel on behalf of the government, George Bezos, who'd actually been one of his lawyers in the trial where he was on trial for his life, to argue against capital punishment. So here was the government now not itself passing the law, but sending the matter to our court and arguing against. The state had counsel because we wanted to hear both sides of the argument, arguing for retention. And Arthur's basic argument was, having canvassed capital punishment, the trend against it throughout the world, uh, the move towards abolition, uh, the fact that most open and democratic societies had abolished it, but two open democratic countries, namely United States and India, still retained it. India had almost abolished it, but it was nominally retained, United States being the one country, and even there the Supreme Court was divided by a narrow majority saying that it was constitutional. And he said, at the end of the day, none of the evidence placed before us as a court indicated that capital punishment was a sufficiently more efficacious deterrent than the knowledge of being caught and sent to jail for a long period to justify its irreversible and drastic consequences. There can be error, there can be a mistake that you can't remedy, and it's something very, very harsh, taking a person's life. And so the evidence didn't establish that somehow the fact that you'll be caught and go to jail for a long time wouldn't be an equally strong deterrent. We all signed on to that. But I wasn't comfortable with that alone. Even if it could be proved that capital punishment did deter, there's some things you don't do. Torture can be very effective from a practical point of view. It can get you information. You don't do it because that's not who we are. The capital punishment isn't simply something that you have to look at from the point of view of the person who's going to be killed. What kind of society are we when we put a rope around someone's neck and we cold-bloodedly execute that person? We are reducing reverence and respect for life. We all become parties to killing. So for me, it was the right to life that was involved, much more than simply the balancing of the deterrent effect. And one by one, we all came in with our different positions. And the word Ubuntu just popped up. It wasn't even used in argument. My colleague Ivan Mohoro was the first one to use it extensively. Ubuntu means it's, it's the spirit of humanity, that I am a person because you're a person. It's very deep in African philosophy. I can't separate my humanity from a recognition of your humanity. And the more I acknowledge your humanity, the more I humanize myself and vice versa. And for Yvonne, Ubuntu was part of that foundation of we can't extinguish life in a cold-blooded way. You, in self-defense, you can kill. In hostage situations, you can kill. In warfare, um, we're not pacifists in that sense, you can kill, but you don't trust somebody, put an injection or electric chair, whatever it might be, you just, just don't do that. And my colleagues, one by one, also gave their own reasons, 
and six out of, five, out, out of 11 used the word Ubuntu, or maybe five out of 11, because it sprang from this African cultural sense. And when I take people on the tour of the court, if, if, if your dad had come on the court, he would have been subjected to a tour of the constitutional court, which we built in the heart of the prison, where both Gandhi and Mandela had been locked up. Nobody else can claim they have a prison where both Gandhi and Mandela were locked up. No other country can make that boast. Uh, I always end the tour by saying, and it's the spirit of Ubuntu that gave us our wonderful new Bill of Rights and Constitution. Amongst millions and millions of ordinary African people, it wasn't the wonderful Mandela and the wise de Klerk that gave us our Constitution. They played an important role. They didn't rock the boat. But the reason why we have the Constitution with the Bill of Rights, with respect for fundamental rights, is in spite of all the hardships of apartheid, all the divisions, that spirit amongst ordinary people, especially the poor, was never destroyed. And that feeling amongst African people so strong that the whites in our country were never generous enough and open enough and large enough to embrace all of us. They always said it's impossible for black and white to live together. We will show them that they are wrong. We will show them in our new country, just as we are showing in our struggle itself, the way we connect up with people in, irrespective of their backgrounds, we will show them that it is possible to live together. That's the spirit of Ubuntu. Then became the ruling, guiding force in our whole new constitutional order. So Ubuntu is now on the map. It's been used in a judgment, and everybody who's a lawyer knows how important it is. Once it's in a judgment, it has a certain hallowed kind of effect, but nobody quite knows how to use it. The second case... That's, by the way, the first one is called the Makwanyani case. Uh, it's gone around the world in terms of countries, societies, considering whether or not to retain or abolish capital punishment, frequently will look at the Makwanyani case uh, from the Constitutional Court of South Africa. But two years later, the Azapo case. Azapo is the Azanian People's Organization. And they were challenging aspects of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, founding statute. They weren't happy with this idea that the people who'd killed Steve Biko and killed other patriots fighting for freedom should be allowed, as a result of telling the truth to the Truth Commission, be allowed to walk free afterwards. And they said that was unconstitutional for various reasons that were argued. Again, we didn't discuss it beforehand, and again we were unanimous after we had discussed, saying that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Act was not incompatible with the, with the, with the Constitution, that it was an option made by Parliament in order to get truth to find out what had happened and to build a bridge from a past that was repressive and violent and divided to a future that would be one based not on retaliation and vengeance, but on reconciliation and Ubuntu. And the word was actually used in the Constitution. And my colleague Ishmael Mohammed, who was the deputy president of the court, wrote such a beautiful judgment I don't know what the quality of your dad's writing was. Uh, I imagine straightforward, pretty good, direct, clear, not pretentious. But this was something where a simply straightforward, good, unpretentious judgment would not have been enough. This was touching on the soul of our nation, on deep emotions, on people who'd suffered. It was touching on a way forward, a kind of vision of the country we wanted to build. It had to be a poetic judgment. It couldn't, you couldn't haul out the Oxford English Dictionary and say the word means, reconciliation means this. It had to be rooted in the emotions, the passions, the understanding, 
the anger, and also the willingness, the sensitivities of our people to move forward. He had to find the right language. And the language he, he wrote it in, it was so thrilling that I, I, this was before we had emails then. So there would be a, a photocopied uh, version of the draft judgment, and I read it, and I put it down, and I rushed over to Ishmael's chambers, and I knocked on the door, and I came, and I said, congratulations, Ishmael. Now, judges don't do that. Uh, <laughs> you might when you meet, but you don't go to the chambers. You might when you meet, you say, well, I think you did a pretty good job. Uh, but that also required, for my part, a poetic response to a very poetic judgment. And he spoke about the, the, the agonizing decision with the truth hidden away in all the crevices of an authoritarian secret society, how important it was to learn what had happened, how important it was to recover the bodies, how important it was for families to know the last moments of their beloved close relatives and lovers and friends who didn't survive, who didn't see freedom afterwards, and how important it was for the whole society to come clean in what had happened in the past. And if the the, the bargain, as it were, the counterpoint for getting that truth was to say, come forward, tell the truth. Become a true member of our society was to say, you'll get amnesty if you do that, so be it. That was a choice Parliament made, and we as a court wouldn't say that it was a wrong choice. With exquisite language. And the theme of Ubuntu was in the uh, Constitution, and it's the spirit of Ubuntu shining through. The third case where Ubuntu featured couldn't have been more trivial. Uh, it was the town clerk of a small municipality had tried to call to account a senior official in the local government for abusing his cell phone. He was allowed so many thousands of rands use per month, and he doubled that. And this official wasn't going to let him get away with it. And he made a speech. He, he spoke about it uh, through a report. I don't know if the report was leaked. And it went to the press. And the official was very angry and denounced the town clerk for uh, being in league with the opposition political party uh, and not fulfilling his functions to be neutral. The town clerk was angry, went to court, sued for damages, and got quite high damages from the trial judge. The matter came on appeal to us. There were lots of technical questions about what we lawyers call privilege and circumstances and so on. Those weren't constitutional questions that, well, they were constitutional questions. We didn't spend too much time on that. Uh, Yvonne Mokoro and I, we often agreed on, we wouldn't discuss beforehand. We found we just, I don't know, she came from a totally different background to myself, growing up in a very poor family in Kimberley, uh, great deprivation far more deprived, you know, these things are comparative, but managing as a woman to defy the assumption that women shouldn't study law, studying law, being a nurse. She said, Albi, I wasn't even a nurse, I was an assistant nurse, and eventually uh, qualifying as a lawyer and becoming a prosecutor, and then becoming a, an assistant lecturer and a lecturer and a professor. Um, and somehow Yvonne and I had a similar spirit. We both felt there was something wrong with the law of libel, the law of defamation, <coughs> being used in this case to put a money value on what had been a wrong statement. And all these cases end up by considering the amount of money that's paid. And sometimes the amounts are huge, and sometimes they're small. What's, how, you can't put a reputation, your soul, your dignity, in the marketplace. 
you trivialize, trivializing human dignity if you put a money value on it more or less in terms of your honor and dignity. And in terms of the African culture and tradition, when somebody has been shown to have wronged you, they must apologize. And they must make up for it in some way that will end up where you are reconnected, not driven further apart. So we both wrote quite strongly on saying that our courts have got to stop thinking that the response for defamation should essentially be in the amount of money you have to pay, which always favors the powerful interests anyhow because they can afford the best lawyers and spin out the cases. It's very rare that a humble person can win a defamation, uh, defamation case. And we brought in the theme of Ubuntu. And that's the whole objective of the law not to simply say right, wrong, guilty, not guilty, pay up, go to jail, give the property over. The function of the law is to try and bring people closer together in terms of a set of shared values that the whole community, the whole society feels is right. That is the African culture and tradition. Justice under a tree, where the elders would sit under a tree, the whole community would listen, participate, and the attempt, even if there was a homicide, the families of the killer and the deceased would get together and talk. They would see it somehow they've also lost out. And the families of parents of the killer would be worried. It's their son. Usually a son has been responsible for this. They would feel a responsibility. They would feel an ache for the parents of the deceased. And it's humanizing the whole process. It's not converting the whole process simply into proof beyond reasonable doubt, you're guilty, then if you're guilty, you must be killed or you must go to jail forever. How can you reintegrate the person in one way and another back into the society? That's very deep in African judicial culture. And I was very struck, I might say, when I was working on my, my, my PhD, uh, by the extent to which some of the great African traditional leaders opposed capital punishment. And the feeling was blood shouldn't follow blood. Uh, you don't punish the crime by killing the killer. You repeat the crime by killing the killer. And that came through in Moshweshwi, uh, people who know South African history, Hintza, um, uh, Mont Montuia, uh, in different parts of the, of the country at different times. That philosophy of attempting to use the judicial mechanisms for reconciliation, reintegration, rather than for segregation and punishment. The theme has been picked up by the court. We were in a minority of two. The others just said we don't have to get there, but it's now been endorsed as the approach which the Constitutional Court would like applied to all defamation cases going very, very strongly for apology as early as possible. Apology not just to reduce damages. You pay less if you say, and you're scared to apologize because once you apologize, you're in big trouble because then you've got to pay up. So there's almost nothing to gain unless you're definitely going to lose. Now, it's the wrong mentality altogether. It's, it's the approach uh, and often an, an approach that's been amplified by counsel on both sides the case runs on and it's a case that gets into the newspapers and exciting and all the rest and so hopefully our approach and the Ubuntu approach is going to function there. The fourth case and there's going to be a fourth and a fifth case that I'll mention was the case where I almost resigned from the bench. I had a crisis it's the Port Elizabeth municipality case, PE municipality case it's called. 15 African families who'd been evicted from their homes, didn't know where to go, saw some vacant land next to a very upmarket white area and erected their shacks there. Nobody was using the land. If there was going to be building later, they could move. The owners of the land said, this is our property. Went to the council, said, kick them off, kick them out. My crisis, and I was asked to prepare the first draft for the court, is I'll be the judge, 
I've sworn an oath to uphold the law without fear, favor, or prejudice. You can't just go and erect your shacks on somebody else's land. They've got to go. Albie, who's been involved in the freedom struggle in South Africa, who understands the background to landlessness, who coined the phrase, in other countries, possession is nine points of the law. In South Africa, dispossession is nine points of the law. 87% of the land reserved by law for whites only. You know why people are living like that? I, Albie, I can't sign an order that's going to evict these 15 families. And if I can't do my work as a judge, I've got to leave, because I've sworn that oath. Fortunately, maybe for me, what was a purely personal dilemma was converted into an intellectual and constitutional tension. The right not to be arbitrarily deprived of your property is in the Constitution. But the right of access to adequate housing is also in our Constitution. And the state must take reasonable, progressive measures within its available resources to realize that right. And then a law was passed <coughs> saying that people shouldn't be evicted unless it's just and equitable to evict them from their homes. Just and equitable. What's just and equitable to the owners of the land is unjust and inequitable for the people putting up their shacks <coughs> and vice versa. And it became clear that this case couldn't be resolved simply on a technical application of land law. Land law and human rights law had to somehow interact with each other, ordinary property law. And the conclusion we came to was that unless there had been attempts to achieve through meaningful engagement, through mediation, some kind of mutually acceptable arrangement, it would not be just and equitable to order their eviction. So justice and equity took on a procedural dimension. There had to be negotiations. And my colleague, Zach Yacoub, picked up on the phrase meaningful engagement and now it's become a principal aspect of our law dealing with evictions. One of the most painful in any developing country, areas of law, where there's a thrust for development, where the rich want to get even richer, the poor are always having to make way for the rich, rich farmers, rich developers, uh, rich people wanting to build near the beaches, whatever it might be, uh, get out, get out, get out. On the other hand, you want development, people have a right to their property, to use their property, how to balance out the two. And now our court insists on meaningful engagement in terms of principles which will ensure if the poor have to move, there must be alternative accommodation provided in the meanwhile. Each poor person has to be looked at as an individual, not as an anonymous mass, the poor. Each family has its own situation, its own intensity of, of rights in terms of the occupation, length of occupation, the meaning of, of evicting them. And I found in writing the judgment, the theme of Ubuntu just came in. And I found myself writing and saying that our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, is nothing if not Ubuntu writ large. And there are good reasons for doing that in South Africa, because the majority of people understand Ubuntu. A Bill of Rights, they know it's important. But a Bill of Rights is a thing that lawyers speak about, and sometimes it's meaningful, sometimes it's not. Ubuntu is something people live. And if you can somehow unify the deep value system of the majority of people as lived in ordinary life with the grand universally accepted principles of fundamental rights, then it's got a powerful foundation. And it gives a, a texture to the Ubuntu, which is not just a lovely thing to have, but it's now got processes and, and, and institutions that will ensure that Ubuntu, when the state power is involved, Ubuntu will be recognized and applied, but it also gives a sense of humanity to the Bill of Rights. It's not just a set of documents. The last case I'm going to deal with separately. It's uh, tomorrow night uh, in, in a different venue, but it combines also one of your interests. It's the question of sending to prison uh, uh, Mrs. M., who had three 
teenage sons in what's called a very fragile, socially fragile area with lots of gangs and drug lords and so on. Uh, and the mother had some compulsive thing. She would use a credit card and go to 20, 30 different stores, including a bottle store, uh, and run up debts, not huge debts, maybe a total amount of, of uh, 200 pounds uh, from 20 different stores, and then get caught, and she is prosecuted. She's given a suspended sentence. And before the suspended sentence is out, she does it again, and she's out on bail, and she does it a third time. And I tell the story against myself, when she applies now for leave to appeal, she's sentenced to four years imprisonment. She says, no, 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 I can't go, I can't go. I want to be with my sons. There's nobody else to look after them. And she appeals to the high court. The high court, on a technicality, knocks out one of the main charges against her. So it's reduced from four years to uh, four years uh, subject to the possibility of correctional supervision after a minimum of about a quarter of the period has been has expired. She says, no, no, if I go to jail for a, for a year, it's going to destroy the family. I have to be with them. I look at that, I think, well, if ever there was a hopeless case, this is the most hopeless one, almost like you must be joking. And one of my colleagues said, but Albie, have you thought about the rights of the child? Not her rights, the rights of her children. Did the magistrate even look at the rights of the child in deciding whether or not to send it to jail? Did the magistrate inquire what's going to happen to those three children if she goes to jail? And so we, I kind of rather reluctantly agreed to at least establish the principle that the rights of the child have to be considered in all cases where somebody's being sent to prison. Long period or short period, if there are children there, the state has a responsibility. The state is locking the person up, the primary caregiver up. The state must now ensure that the children suffer the least amount possible. And in the borderline case, the state must take that into account and decide not to use a custodial sentence. We speak about a custodial sentence rather than go to jail. Uh, it's the same thing. So I say to my colleague, um, OK, we'll establish the principle, but she doesn't stand a chance on, on the merits. I mean, three times. Uh, but we'll get welfare reports. And meanwhile, some years have passed. And it turns out she's actually set up two businesses, uh, one of which is a bail bond business. <laughs> 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 and the other is a laundry. She's running them very well. She's a key person on the Parent Teachers Association. And she's been a model person. And there's nobody else in the family who's going to look after these three kids. Now, that's another kind of dilemma for me. And I think, you know, what's going to be good for society? To send her to jail, the three boys now almost inevitably, their lives are wrecked. Uh, there are going to be future problems for them, for society. The grocery stores, the bottle stores and the others, they get nothing back. Um, she's alienated from the community. She's disgraced. What, what benefit is that going to be for anybody except you're making the point, thou shalt not steal through persistent credit card uh, uh, abuse? And I'm persuaded. I'm persuaded, and the majority of my colleagues are persuaded. And that's a recommendation of the social welfare people that keeping her out of jail will be far more beneficial for society than sending her to jail. If Ubuntu means anything in our country, this would be a good case for that. If she had killed or raped or you know, done something absolutely drastic where you have to signify you just have to go to jail. And then you must find alternative care and foster parents and so on, maybe. 
But this was a case where she actually had shown over five years now she is capable of leading an honest life. And there was something compulsive in her behavior and she clearly needed some kind of counseling. And if she could pay back the people she had robbed, because she's now earning, so she's got some money, and they will acknowledge and realize, gosh, this is an amazing legal system. You actually get something back from the people who stole stolen from you. And if she does some community service that is valuable and in itself, and not just sitting in jail waiting for the time to pass, surely that will be much more beneficial. And there's sometimes that this, the community can do more to rehabilitate, rehabilitate somebody and uphold the norms of the law than the state can do. The state's very limited in its capacities to very crude mechanisms. The community can bring to bear a sense of connection uh, and this is a part of, of our country where the spirit of Ubuntu traditionally is not, not so strong. In any event, that was the majority decision um, of, of, of our court. So just to wrap up then. I was very struck 10, 15 years ago by a fierce debate in law faculties in the United States that just divided them down the middle between the libertarians and the communitarians. And it was, which side were you on? You had to, you had to choose, boy. You know, don't fudge the issue. And it became bitter and personal. And people would be appointed on the basis and get tenure on the basis of being seen as supporting the one group against the other. The libertarians basically said, our law is about protecting the fundamental liberty and autonomy and freedom of choice of each individual. And that's why freedom and liberty and personal decision-making is the foundation of our law. And you communitarians, you see everything in collective terms and you will suppress the individual. The communitarians are saying, individuals don't live as isolated beings. We live in neighborhoods. We live in families. We live in cities. We live in cultures. We live in languages. We live in faith communities. And you become a rich in, richer individual through your association with others. So stop speaking about human beings as though they're little islands unto themselves. Now I find myself agreeing with the criticism each had of the other. So I wouldn't have got any job because I was neither a libertarian pure or communitarian pure. But I would have said I'm a dignitarian. And dignity is the concept that unites the preciousness of the each individual. Each person counts. That's part of your dignity. You're not just a unit belonging to a particular grouping in society. You are you with your destiny, your life, your vocation, your choices, your right to autonomy, a huge achievement of humankind. But dignity also acknowledges that you live amongst fellow human beings, not on your own. Uh, I often worry that the uh, ultimate outcome of the pure American libertarian approach is that you are dying of hunger, but with your last breath you can curse the government. <laughs> uh, and that can't be right. So it's dignity then that allows you to use your last breath however you want, but it also acknowledges that you shouldn't die of starvation. That's all part of your dignity. And our concept of Ubuntu uh, is very, very, very close to human dignity. And to the extent that the law appreciates that, so many of the problems that end up as purely technical problems of definition find a resolution that accords with the lives that people lead. I like to feel that, that uh, John, I'm already calling him John like, like I knew him. Uh, intuitively, he knew that. He was a people's person. Uh, he wasn't looking for technical arguments. He didn't see the law as something standing out there on its own with a pure rationality, and it's unfortunate if, if the outcome is unjust and unfair. Uh, the job is to do justice. Uh, you take an oath to do justice to all, not just to solve disputes, to do justice to all. Each case, in a way, becomes a metaphor of the values of the society. It's not just settling 
a dispute between two individuals. And the sense I get is, is that John Fitzsimons was exactly that kind of person from totally, totally, totally different backgrounds. That's what <coughs> unites us. And in a sense, the unification is all the more profound because it's based purely on values. It's not on any shared common interest or any benefit that we get out of it. Uh, once upon a time, I, I used to say, workers of the world unite. Now it's judges of the world unite. <laughs> and it's a really wonderful thing to say, and I think it's a nice phrase to end our presentation on. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that inspiring and uh, breathtaking lecture on the dignity of humanity. And I think that uh, I can see some wonderful judgments from the Court of Session and indeed our Supreme Court, including that philosophy in the future. Uh, and that's not a command, it's a direction. <laughs> um, I think we have some time now for some questions before we have some drinks uh, thereafter. Uh, if you're up for this, do we have any questions for? Uh, just to say to you that this, this session will be filmed, but your questions will not be. They'll be paraphrased, so you'll not be identified. I don't know if it's an advantage or disadvantage of, of a former judge. Uh, I can answer any question except the difficult ones. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't comment on the cutbacks. That's something, you know, I'm a visitor here and, and I'll follow your debates uh, with great interest. And uh, uh, the road of the prosecution, one would like to see that, no, no, in fact, the prosecutions can play, the prosecution service an enormously important role, uh, stronger in a way in developing societies than, than elsewhere. Uh, it's so important that the high and mighty be prosecuted um, and that there isn't impunity which unfortunately you get in, in many countries. And where people are appointed to head the prosecution service on the basis that they know where their bread is buttered uh, and they will look favorably on the president or wherever it might be. I'm not speaking about South Africa now. Uh, our courts have dealt with issues like that. Our courts are very independent. The president is accepted. Uh, the head of the prosecuting authority was appointed by the president and uh, the constitutional court uh, invalidated that appointment, saying that it just couldn't be justified on, on rationality grounds at all uh, because of um, uh, a commission having found that that person uh, had been untruthful, a government-appointed commission, uh, and a uh, very weak record on, on, on other areas. So prosecuting authorities can become agents for persecution, and they can become agents for ensuring that the Constitution is upheld and integrity is maintained. Uh, what one would like to see is, is the prosecution authority with that broad vision uh, that would welcome restorative justice. Uh, restorative justice is quite well known in legal circles in terms of juvenile justice. Um, already started in Chicago in the 19th century uh, developed, it's quite strong throughout the world. The idea is you keep young offenders out of the formal justice system because it's hopeless. They go to jail, you 
have the legal defense, uh, their destiny is going to be disastrous. And that's where you bring the families in, and maybe even the local pastor or somebody else, and you have face-to-face -face interaction between the offender and the, uh, and, and, and the accused person. It's a whole different philosophy, a whole different approach. But the idea is to extend that from simply young people to make it a more profound principle in the justice system generally. And uh, I wish our prosecutors were not so overwhelmed with work. I wish there was more time for exploratory, at least, work in, in that area. In principle, these ideas are recognized. But um, in practice, it's only in the area of juvenile justice. And occasionally, with a, a judicial officer who's tuned into these values, insisting on uh, an attempt at bringing the offender and, and, and the the victim, uh, the victim's family, uh, and the perpetrator uh, bring them together. Um, does law play a role in, um, I'm just summarizing it now, in the development of um, society, and particularly developing society, is an enormously important role. And it can be a role that's totally negative, where the law is there only to defend the powerful, the corrupt, uh, entrenched, or the law can be um, there to help the marginalized. And these are struggles going on all over the world now. I've just come from Kenya, where I had the extraordinary task of being a member of a board, one of three foreign judges, Commonwealth judges, on a vetting board, mm. investigating, interviewing judges and now magistrates who were alleged to have granted impunity through twisting the law in the past, taking bribes, various other mechanisms like that. And in the end, we decided 13 out of 43 had to go. It included four out of the top nine judges. Uh, and there it, it was clear that there was wholesale looting of government coffers, not by bank robbers coming in with a gun, with maybe the collusion of one or two tellers inside, but the minister of this, the minister of that, the, uh, and it would end up that there would be a permanent stay of prosecution because of this, that, or the other reason that's given. And so far from the legal system helping to bring to book people using their positions of authority and power to rob the people in a country that had so much poverty and so much landlessness and homelessness and lack of access to education. It, it was doubly criminal because it was stealing, it was against the law, but it was the rich stealing to become even richer and using their position in the state to get away with it and the judges being there to find either through ultra-technicism or what upset me even more in a way, through uh, such an expansive view of the Bill of Rights that it went beyond any possible balancing and tipped over completely in favor of the rights of the individuals who happened to be crooks big time to not even be prosecuted, not even be uh, judged in any way. In any event, so one can see the, the uh, options that face the judicial system and the judiciary in these countries. And happily, Kenya's got some brilliant judges, including their current chief justice, who feel that law should be there to help the poor, the marginalized, and the new Kenyan constitution expressly mentions that. Uh, and I'm hoping at some stage, sometime this year, to write about the rule of law. I used to be a rule of law skeptic. Uh, everything, apartheid was done through the law in South Africa. So we had the rule of law. You could go to court, you could have legal defense, and you're still chucked out of your home because you were the wrong color. You were still sent to jail. Uh, you still were denied rights through the law. Uh, and we used to speak about so-called human rights. It was one word, so-called human rights. <laughs> uh, you know, when Henry Kissinger and others were speaking about human rights, human rights, human rights, but fostering coups and assassination of people like Allende, it became so-called human rights. For me, in fact, it was South American people at conferences here in the UK speaking about derechos humanos, with the same passion that we spoke about national liberation, who won me over, drop the so-called. We've got to make human rights meaningful for us, for ordinary people, for people fighting for freedom and 
don't allow anybody to claim human rights for themselves as part of their foreign policy, human rights are for the people. And now I'd like to write on the rule of law as an emancipatory doctrine. Uh, not, we want rule of law to protect foreign investment. Uh, you can't arbitrarily see stuff and dish it out to your pals and so on, sure. But somehow rule of law in developing countries is seen simply as related to that. You can invest in that country and you can be sure the courts will be there to make sure the government doesn't seize your investments. That's the rule of law. That's okay, but that's just a tiny part. What about the rule of law for women who are being beaten up in their homes? Aren't they entitled to law and protection of the law? I'm sure your report mm -hmm. made exactly that point. What about the rule of law for people who are being evicted from land that they and their ancestors have been on for generations? Because they just don't get a hearing because the judges are corrupt, because the lawyers are corrupt. So the rule of law then can be extremely important for marginalized groups uh, in all sorts of different ways. And if one can give the rule of law that expansive quality, then it gets uh, an extra significance for society. People believe in it more. Not the rule of lawyers mm -hmm. and the rule of judges speaking in coded language, but the rule of law for ordinary people and Business men and business women are ordinary people. They also benefit from the rule of law. They're not excluded from it because of their class position, but they don't have exclusive monopoly of, of, of that notion. Uh, I know many Hamishes <laughs> and many Hendersons, but, uh, and I wish I could say I know the book, uh, and I probably came across it. I, I take it was a book written in the period of, of the free Nelson Mandela dur during that period. But I can't say, yes, a great book, I know it, uh, a Long Live Scotland. Um, and then the Human Rights Act and, and social rights. Um, on our court, traditionally South African courts were very different uh, showed great deference to the top British courts as a kind of independent wisdom. The minute we got a new constitution with fundamental rights, sorry to say this, but your courts were useless. <laughs> <laughs> because you were operating in a different realm. And you could only say what did Parliament intend and you could use you know, you could use a little bit of the canons of construction to get somewhere, but it was often very contrived. Mm -hmm. And there were canons that went this way and canons that went that way, and you chose some rather than others. It was all rather arbitrary. <laughs> Your courts did terrific work in judicial review mm -hmm. and asserting the power of government to look at individual acts of government. But you couldn't look at the laws themselves. You could look at the bylaws the regulations, but not the primary laws from Parliament. Now we're dealing with primary laws from Parliament. Capital punishment was authorized by our statutes. Mm -hmm. So we could get nothing from here. The minute the Human Rights Act came in, the character of legal reasoning in the UK changed. I don't know how extensive it's been, but I think it's been quite extensive. It's changed the nature of the debate. Mm -hmm. And concepts like proportionality become vital. Before it's not proportionality, before it's always definitional. Classification and definitions. Now you're moving to context, the intensity of the values that are involved, the impact on society, the meaning of values. Values, values, values come in. But value is not just some abstract nice thing to have, but values as intrinsic to the nature of the legal system and the rights that people can legitimately claim. And so now we found ourselves, we were looking to the House of Lords and now it will be the Supreme Court of Justice because we are, if I say singing from the same hymn sheet, that would be unfair to the people who are not believers. So we are uh, on the same page. And we might be writing different things and it's been thrilling for me. I've even seen Sachs J, mm -hmm. quoted once or twice. Very often. So uh, in the Supreme Court here, we're citing South African constitutional uh, court decisions, um, uh, myself included, and I've been on the losing side a few times in the Supreme Court. 
but uh, it, it, it is the case that we're learning from the jurisprudence in South Africa now uh, in the context of human rights development. So, so I think it's been a huge gain, and, and it is a bit disturbing uh, to, to notice the... Uh, I'm, I'm reaching the limits of what, as a visiting judge, I can legitimately say. Uh, but um, I think it would be a huge loss, I can say it from this point of view, to the prestige that, that British law has internationally, which has been very, very high for, for very good reasons. Um, even although some of the colonial judges weren't the epitome of, of fairness and justice when they had opportunities, and even although the Privy Council didn't always come down in ways that one would have expected and hoped they would do, by and large, there was a tradition of fairness, of rationality, of balance, belonging to the old era, uh, and now the Supreme Court is in the new era, and you, know, you have some wonderful judges and judgments, and you're allying these values which have come from the European Convention of Human Rights, which Britain helped very much to, to elaborate in the first place, uh, and they're feeding into legal thinking. And some people say, no, but how can we do that because we're allowing these foreigners to dictate uh, our, our values in the UK? Well, one element that should be taken into account in making that choice, if that choice is made, is it's going to isolate the UK from... The, uh, I would say the strongest legal minds throughout the world, I don't just mean in South Africa, but you speak about Canada and now in Kenya uh, and Australia and New Zealand and Canada and the United States. South America is beginning now in terms of social and economic rights. They are going so strong. We in, in South Africa were the, ahead of the world in terms of finding constitutional remedies for violations of social and economic rights within the framework of reasonableness, mm -hmm. where you give great deference to government, but if the act is just unreasonable, then you can impose a remedy, and we're required to do that. We did that in very important HIV antiretrovirals case and other cases that were quite important. Uh, and I suspect social and economic rights, that's the big growth industry in terms of jurisprudence in the coming, coming decades. In Africa, for sure. In Latin America now, with lots of very powerful courts. Partly the post-dictatorship, post-authoritarian. People had that all-round view of human dignity. And it wasn't enough that you simply had freedom of speech and the right to vote and dealing with abuses of power by those in authority. People out there had certain rights that they could claim. So I expect to see great advances uh, in, in that regard. And it's beginning to be seriously debated in the UK. I can't put it higher than that. There's a chap, Johnny Butterfield, who's invited me to some conferences, and he's getting good attendance. And I think this theme of how can you legitimately deal with social and economic rights without offering pie in the sky, which won't help anybody, but integrates the right to education, the right to health, the right to housing, these basic rights into some vision of the proper role for the judiciary. Uh, I would love to see the terrific expertise and, and um, finesse mm -hmm. of, of British jurisprudence grappling with those issues and enriching those particular issues. That's it. <laughs>